and broadcaster and communications coach, Candy O. Want to wow everyone with your speaking voice? Download The Speaker Coach on your favorite podcast platform. Welcome to Live with Lisa. It's been quite a few months and people all around the world are experiencing changes they never anticipated. Let's just say, actually, working from home is one of them, as my dog is now barking in the background. But also, I'm thinking quarantine, social distancing, just for some of the examples. And when I created Lunch with Lisa, it was provide a quick break on your crazy day. We thought it might be a couple weeks to bring you timely inspiration and motivation. And we've adapted to the new normal. And so we adapted the show, and we're thankful that you found us here on YouTube. And here we can be live, and the links are there to watch anytime. But if you come to us when we are live, it's the opportunity for you to come and ask questions and participate as part of the conversation. So if you love the shows, as many of you I know do, please click subscribe and tell your friends to click subscribe click subscribe, and make sure you hit the little bell also so that you're alerted when we schedule a new guest. What's great is you can set the reminders for the guests you don't want to miss. So back to this crazy time and quarantines and social distancing, with any great challenge comes great opportunity. And I'm thrilled to welcome back Michael Grove. And Michael chairs the Landscape Architecture, Civil Engineering, and Ecology Division at the internationally esteemed architecture and design firm Sasaki. Michael is responsible for the design of some of the most forward-thinking urban farms in the world. And today we're going to talk about the focus we need on food for our cities and how we can take this moment to develop new opportunities of how we source our food, how we eat our food, and how we can just have greater equality and, and how we live. So, Michael, thank you for joining. Thanks for having me, Lisa. I'm glad to be here again. Yes, super. And, you know, for those of you who know that Michael and I work together from a public relations standpoint, you've been quite a feature on the news and you have a segment coming out on Friday. And this is really fascinating to everybody because people may not have been thinking about their food and where it's sourced from and, and you know, they go to the grocery store and they just get it. But you've been working on this all over the world. So would you share with us just some of the things that we need to be thinking about as we're thinking about our food over the coming years? Sure. I mean, well, who doesn't love food, right? It's the one great unifier that brings us all together. And I think we've seen it now a lot more during the pandemic where we're having this intimate experience. We're hearing about food shortages. Uh, we're experiencing a totally different uh, grocery store experience when we go there. Um, people are planting backyard gardens again. There's this reconnection with the land. Uh, yep. Yep, me as well. Um, kids <laughs> are getting into it uh, now that people are home and have kind of more time to share that with their families. And that's a, a really great kind of signifier of things to come. And I think historically, we have always separated cities from farms. Uh, cities are where kind of uh, great populations were. They were concrete jungles. The farm was something kind of distant and bucolic. Right. Nobody gave it a second thought. And what we've been doing at Sasaki over the past few years is thinking about how do we bring the two together? It's a right. really strange disconnect to think that our food comes from hundreds, if not thousands of miles away from where these major urban population centers are. How right. can we kind of repair that distance and get healthier food to us faster and in a more equitable way? So, Michael, you know, Sasaki put a great report out and I'm looking at it now. I've got a bunch of notes. And by 2050, there will be 9.7 billion people on our planet, 80 percent of them living in cities. And so this is, again, where your firm ties right into this, that with a focus on cities, how do you get food into the cities, right? And where does it come from? So how much more food are we going to need to, not to just get into the cities, but to feed all of these people? So talk to yeah. us about that. Well, 9.6 billion mouths is, is a lot to feed, right? So um, what one thing that's happening, if we kind of just go along the current trajectory, is an incredible amount of deforestation and habitat mm -hmm. loss as a result of agriculture. If we're continuing to farm in the same way that we have for 10,000 years, which is soil-based, we're cutting down forests to, to plant more, the more people that you have to feed with that kind of traditional approach is going to wreak havoc on our li larger biodiverse systems on the planet. And right. not to mention kind of habitat loss, the, the need for water, uh, water quality, use of fertilizer and pesticides to support all of that as well. Um, so. 
it's a huge kind of ecological environmental issue that we're, we're dealing with, but you also have to think about it in the context of climate change as well, right. where we plant kind of a lot of our fruits and vegetables, fertile places like uh, in California, these are susceptible to drought. We're seeing um, more flooding happening uh, coastal, but along inland rivers as well, that provides a lot of uh, the, the fertile kind of sediment for our farming. So we have to rethink kind of where we're farming to reduce some of those risks in the future. We have a really cool picture up here from Taiwan. And would you tell people, I mean, I'd love for people to guess what that is outside of being a farm, but uh, as we're a live show, I'm gonna let you tell us what that yeah, is. Yeah, I mean, this is a market. This is a, a market and grocery store. This is, we have them all around the world, these big box things surrounded by parking. They typically have flat asphalt, blacktop roofs, um, it's an unused space. So what better place than a market to have kind of that immediate access to food? I think one thing that a lot of research has been done on lately is how much nutrient loss happens once fruits and vegetables are picked. Right. And as much as kind of 30% of nutrients lost within the first three days after harvest and over 80% after about seven to eight days. And if you think wow. about it, most of the food that you're getting at your local grocery store if it's coming from California, it's being shipped cross country in trucks. That's taking at least a week after harvest before it's coming to you. Uh, here in New England in the winter, and a lot of our food comes from the Southern Hemisphere, and that's being shipped up uh, in shipping containers from places like Chile, which could take weeks to arrive here, and it's in refrigerated shipping containers. Um, and it's lost the majority of its nutrients by then. But if you could go to the roof of your grocery store where you know somebody's harvested it immediately, right. you're eating it within 24 hours, you're getting so much more nutrition, so much higher nutrient content in that food. This is a show that we should do where we talk about how nutrition really affects uh, how we eat. So if we're not getting enough nutrients, then we eat more, which leads to us not being as healthy, having more weight than we should. I remember reading about an apple that might have been a month old and how much sugar and starch was in it versus the actual nutrients of an apple. So you thought you were eating healthy and you actually weren't eating nearly as healthy as you thought you were because of how old the apple was. And this is what we're talking about is how much quicker can we get people the fresh food so that we're eating healthier, maybe not eating as much, not good food, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think one of the things that we've seen in, at least in the US and a lot of cities is this disparity between people who have access to more nutritional food and the inequity of a lot of urban landscapes where there are food deserts. People don't have the grocery stores with the fresh food. They're relying on uh, Family Dollar or Burger King for kind of the processed food. And that becomes one of the main sources of the nutritional content in those communities. And that's kind of the vast inequity that we're seeing in cities today. So how can you create spaces within cities uh, for community gar gardens, for vertical farms, for more productive landscapes that bring those fresh food, food choices closer um, to people who traditionally have been marginalized and, and don't have the same access to some of the, the things we do in wealthier parts of the city or the suburbs. Well, I think this is fascinating, this picture we have up, because as we know, we've done a lot of work in real estate our whole careers, and real estate is driven by the market. And so if you've got beachfront property and it could support a hotel, you know someone's going to want to come in and put a hotel there right? And that is another piece of the inequality that we always talk about is what type of housing is being built? What type of retail is being built? And is that fair to, to everyone? And as we really focus on our cities, one of the things I'm fascinated about is the, is the whether it's grants or investments from major companies like an Amazon, right? So as we know, Amazon bought Whole Foods, that, that tells us something. But if Amazon's investing in companies like Plenty Vertical Farms, or NASA's, you know, granting freight farms. What does that tell us, Michael, about where the direction of everything is going? Uh, it, it's showing us that there's a lot of concern in the market about the future of food security and how we're sourcing our food. Um, yeah. When you think about it, there's a ton of unused space in cities. Um, you know, cities are continuing to expand. Our suburbs are growing. We're pushing into natural environments. The need for agricultural land is growing. 
obviously something's got to change at some point. We're going to get past the point of no return if we continue to consume land resources in the same ways we have been traditionally. Um, so what these kind of early investors are, are doing is looking at alternatives for how we grow food differently. And a lot of it might seem like science fiction, kind of hydroponics and growing food kind of in these vertical systems. It's been studied for years. I remember as a kid going to Disney World and in this exhibit called The Land, where they were actually doing hydroponics. Yeah. This is in the early 1980s, right? So oh, right. this isn't like it's a, a new concept. This is something that's been studied for years. Uh, there's, there's proof of concept behind it. And now is the time to kind of bring that science into uh, real production, where you could have uh, larger yields, where you could have the logistics centers and, and the production around it to send it out to grocery stores, to send it to the hotels and restaurants in the cities who are, are using it. Um, so it's really, again, about just having access to uh, all of these fresh fruits and vegetables closer to, to where the people are. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage people to watch the show the last time that you were on. And maybe my team can put a link to that um, in the chat. But the reason why is we talked a lot about the risks of cutting down forest and going into natural habitats and how that creates disease and illness and potentially pandemics. And so I think it was great the way you outlined that out. It, today, what I really wanna focus on is now if we're going to be doing these things, and here the picture that's up right now is a project you have going in Shanghai, that this can be real, that we don't need to take out more farmland, we can bring it into the city and, and such a much more efficient, well, efficient and effective way because you have such a multiple of how much you can develop. So. With this project in Shanghai, and correct me if I'm wrong, you won a Fast Company Innovation Award for this. Is that right? We did. That's right. Kind of in, in, in the food kind of category about how do you rethink food systems. And this project um, is on about 250 acres in Shanghai. Shanghai is a city of 23 million people. Mm -hmm. They're actually pretty progressive about preserving farmland around the city. Um, mm -hmm. But still, that's not enough to support that many mouths. And right. when you think about Shanghai, we looked at their traditional diet, which is about 56% leafy greens. Um, so why not take that into consideration and uh, really expand upon that? And in this vertical environment, you could yield as much as 40 to 100 times more produce than you could in a traditional kind of soil-based plot. So there's right. an efficiency here in, in going vertical. And it also makes sense in a city any city like Shanghai or others where land prices are so expensive. Um, it's the same yeah. reason we build skyscrapers, right? You go up because it's actually right. cheaper than going out. Right, right. And it's beautiful. I mean, this is beautiful to walk around. What is the uh, climate here? Like, you know, throughout the year that, uh, that is around, I mean, is it fairly sunny? Is it warm? So Shanghai is a lot like kind of Washington, D.C., North Carolina. It's it's temperate. It's hot and humid in the summer. It can snow in the winter. So it's not a, you know, a, a, a four, full year kind of growing cycle, which is, you know, like we are here in New England. We can we can grow a few months of the year. Um, but that's why a lot of cities should really start to consider um, what's called controlled environment agriculture. That's kind of the indoor farming. It's, you know, we've done it for centuries with greenhouses. Uh, this is just bringing that to kind of the next level, bringing, you know, it's it's greenhouses on steroids. Essentially, you're going up, um, you're increasing the yield from those, uh, you're bringing them closer to the city center. Right. And then I'm thinking, too, you know, we've talked about right now, what can we do in any of our cities? And it's utilizing space that we're not utilizing or that's underutilized. And this is a project that you have in the Philippines. And I I think about when I see this, and I asked the team to put this picture in in particular, because I think about our beautiful Rose Kennedy uh, Greenway in Boston, it really loops through. And I I don't know if I sh if we can do this or I should say this, but you know, wouldn't it be cool if we had areas that were vegetable gardens and areas that had produce and that you know, when we walked through, it wasn't just beautiful, but I feel like children could learn from you know, watching something grow, or maybe children haven't even seen gardens before in the city. And so I'd love for you to share what you are looking to establish with this garden. And then what can we learn from this to bring into other cities, whether it's Boston or Detroit or anywhere in the States? Yeah. 
I mean, absolutely. We've we've had a lot of conversations lately throughout this current pandemic around rethinking public space. We've uh, a lot of cities have started to close off public streets, kind of removing the car and providing that space back to pedestrians. Mm -hmm. um, even before the pandemic, we were looking at the future of parking garages, you know, in a, a shared economy when people are using Ubers instead of having private cars or, or taking those into the city. What is all that underground space going to be used for? Um, and right. having a productive... Real quick, I don't mean to cut yeah. you off, but I remember last year being shocked hearing that some of our garages in Boston were down 30% in revenue because there were so many fewer cars, people were using Uber, uh, some public transportation, but really the Uber and that car that garages were going to need to start being designed to be more flexible, to maybe be something else in the future, because we didn't think they're going to be using so many cars. So I didn't mean to cut you off, but I think it's fascinating. Um, and here's actually, if that's a New York City garage, what they're doing in Singapore is they're using that space to build, to to grow food now, right? Yes, so. I mean, Singapore is a great example. The Singapore Food Agency has actually said by 2030, we're gonna uh, grow 30% of all the fruits and vegetables consumed in Singapore in Singapore. Singapore is kind of a, a, a city, it's, it's land constrained, right? It's um, mm -hmm. it, it requires kind of innovative thinking for where that land's gonna come from. So these underground garages, the rooftop farms we've mentioned before, yeah. vertical farming. Oh, I love uh, yeah, putting it on this the side like, of parking garages. Oh, I want um, my team to go back one if they can, because this is just an eyesore, right? Yeah. I mean, I would think, unless you really like garage architecture, but, <laughs> you know, I would think, and if you go to the next one, I think this is amazing and beautiful to have on the side now and inspiring. Yeah, I mean, to my knowledge, there's no parking garage kind of awards program, um, but something like this. It's certainly inspiring. It creates value for the community. Um, it provides an important resource. It's again, uh, a reuse of an underutilized space, um, right. whether it's kind of public streets, underground garages, the sides of buildings, the roofs of buildings. We're doing it here in Boston at Fenway Farms. A lot of people don't even realize this is here on top of the, the country's oldest ballpark where a country a, a company called Green City Growers is managing a farm on, on the roof of Fenway Park. Uh, a lot of the, the greens grown there are going directly into the food sold at the concessions when you're there for a baseball game. So again, this is happening. This is uh, not something that's kind of far-fetched uh, right. Gene Roddenberry type of stuff. Um, although well, NASA may have been involved in the early research, it's something that we can bring to all cities around the world right now. I watched a webinar yesterday, Fox Rock Properties also out of Boston. They uh, have bees. They're putting bees on their on the tops of their buildings now and they have a company that comes in and they created their own they call it fox rock farms and they're harvesting the honey and providing it for tenants and providing it for people in the area and uh and just talking about how they can contribute this rooftop space you know in this way and i just thought it was fascinating to watch this webinar on on how they were doing it and how excited they were about it that's a great example. And, you know, pollinators are so important to f food systems and, and landscapes. I think a lot of people don't realize we talk about the importance of bees for things like honey because they're right. kind of a direct product that we all enjoy. Um, but those pollinators are important to move the nectar around the plants that, that we eat and kind of um, losing those populations, whether it's from, again, habitat loss or climate change. Uh, mm -hmm. It's something that we need to be cognizant of. What's interesting about the controlled environment agriculture is mm -hmm. you don't need to have all of those kind of uh, impacts from climate change. This is mm -hmm. a controlled system. Um, you can manage water use. You can. You don't need pesticides or fertilizers because you're not dealing with harmful insects uh, or a loss of nutrients in the soil. You're you're providing a specific nutrient medium for these plants to grow in. Um, a lot of it is is automated, kind of the robotics. So. Uh, sure. There's not a, a ton of need for for labor out in the fields, kind of menial labor. Um, this is bringing in kind of a, a new labor sector, very highly trained, uh, techn technologically savvy. Um, and again, this Little Leaf Farms here in Devons, Massachusetts, um, sold in Whole Foods and Market Basket. And you can right. eat these greens within a day or two of, of them having been harvested. 
you know, since I've been working with you on this the past few months, every time I'm in the grocery store now, I'm looking at all the little labels on the food. And I put one down the other day because I recognized it is one of these that we've been talking about. I mean, I saw another one with that. I was like, oh, I need to get that one because that's a local farm. And it was really funny. So, um, you know, we can choose with our dollars too who we choose to support. So would you explain this slide to us? So in cities, food motivates us and gets us out to try something new. A little hard to read, I think, on the screen, um, but 46% of the city population is driven by a new restaurant. Is that what that basically says? Yeah. So at Sasaki, a few years ago, we did a survey to kind of understand how cities were changing and what motivated people to kind of move around the city, be mobile, um, be proud of their own city. We thought it would be things like great architecture or a beautiful waterfront park or a, a mm -hmm. sports field or stadium. It was actually food. Um, <laughs> like the slide shows, 46% of respondents said that they would venture beyond their neighborhood to try a new restaurant. It's again, the idea that food unites, food is a communal experience. Um, and I think that also would translate to these productive landscapes, community gardens. The more people you can get kind of involved in food, it's a very social thing. It brings us together, whether we're growing it, harvesting it, eating it. Um, right. it it's really, you know, it's something that we can't ignore. And younger generations are specifically in tune to. Sure. So I feel like the great thing that we're talking about today is that there's more going on than maybe people realize, even in our own cities, and that there's opportunity for, it's, it's an economic driver also. You know, we've talked about the fact that when a city is focused on, you know, one type of industry, they fall at risk when that industry comes up and comes down. And where something like food, where we all need to consume it, no matter what, if we can have it in all of our cities and be producing it in a greater way, then it helps stabilize our economy at the same time. Again, economic factors, I don't think people have been thinking about until, you know, it's been really more in the forefront during the quarantine. So mm -hmm. what is this picture here? This looks like a really cool place. Very, I don't so know. This is, this is called the Songjuan Arts and Agriculture City. It's just outside of Beijing, where we mm -hmm. were asked to rethink what the relationship between an, an urban area and agriculture would be. And we actually inverted the, the paradigm here, where we said, rather than pushing farms to the edges and having the city at the center, why don't we integrate them? There's actually so much of the economy that's based on agriculture beyond yeah. food that we don't even think about, whether it's energy production, uh, textiles, you know, a, a lot of the clothes we wear are actually plants that have been grown right. somewhere. Um, the fashion industry can be deeply tied to this pharmaceuticals and traditional medicine. Um, so how can you create opportunities for new kind of economic growth within cities that's more intimately tied to the land? I think when we, we think about agriculture, we just think about the food that we eat. But there's actually so much more ability to kind of prosper off of it and that companies use. And if you can connect them directly to the research and development, uh, it makes more sense for them as well. I think that's another piece to this is the technology. And so not only are we coming up with newer and greater technology, but also all the data that people can either provide from their farms. You know, I know that Fox Park was saying they're tied in with a NASA study on climate change. And so people are starting to identify where all these beehives are mm -hmm. so that they know what's happening around them. And you were telling me about a few others. You have other examples like that of, of people providing data? Yeah, I mean, there's there's this overall kind of smart cities movement right now where sensor technology is providing us all kinds of data points on anything from kind of congestion and how long traffic lights are timed to kind of building efficiencies, energy usage, water consumption, uh, all the way down to kind of uh, food systems, climate change. Uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is a great example where they have uh, kind of a citizen science driven program where anybody who's kind of a backyard bird watcher uh, can upload the, the birds that they've seen and the season they've seen them in onto this great database. All right. of that information from thousands of people allows the university to kind of track migration patterns, understand climate change. When they, when they see kind of migratory birds earlier in the season than normally, they understand how temperatures are warming. Uh, the same applies to the sensor technology you were mentioning with insects, specifically right. bees. Um, and it allows us to pre predict what some of the impacts from climate change will be. Um, you know, one example is that 
you know, trees and plants rely on soil temperature for their bloom times, but mm -hmm. bees rely on air temperature. And so if you have warmer air temperatures uh, and bees are kind of coming out earlier, but don't yet have the plants, you know, to, to eat the nectar from, you have this incredible disconnect between these two important systems. And, you know, we're not quite sure what that means yet, but it is right, raising a, a little bit of a red flag in terms of things we need to be thinking about uh, along the impacts from climate change beyond the traditional of like coastal flooding and forest fires that most people already have on their radar screens. I think that's a, that's a really good point of how we can make the public so much more aware of how they can help provide information based on their hobby. I mean, when you talk about tracking birds and trees, that was my grandmother's favorite thing to do. So I can only imagine if she had had a database where she could be putting that in all day, that would have been like her full-time hobby and she would have loved that. And then have been getting data back about what people were learning. I, I think there are so many people that might enjoy doing that. And um, I mean, I'm a, such an avid gardener and you know, people find humor in how much I enjoy um, what's going on with my worms and my compost. I can't remember how many of these videos I've talked about that on, but I'm really quite obsessed with it. But you know what I say to my family is that if we don't have a lot to put in the compost every day, then we're not eating very well, right? Because right. if we're eating a cheeseburger, nothing's going in the compost. Right. But if we're having salads and we're having, you know, we've been doing a lot of Greek salads and tomato mozzarella and all these, well, there's there's the cuttings from things and I need to take it out to the compost and I know that we're eating well. So I think it's it's pretty fascinating how we can really start to include the, the everyday person who you may not have thought about, mm -hmm. who has a tremendous amount of data that will help us understand what's happening. And, and I'm really excited. So with that, in our only 25 minutes, but Michael, what, what again, that takeaway, right? So we're starting to see more in the cities. We've got rooftop gardens. We've got bees. We've got all sorts of things. I can't wait to see a tower that goes up. It's food. But anything else that we should be thinking about that people are going to leave today and go, I think. I mean, so much of this for me boils down to education and access. When you're providing these types of resources of farming within the cities, there's a whole new generation of people that's understanding the importance of food uh, to their own health and lifestyle. Um, so th that's a big part of it for me is, is making it kind of more accessible um, so that people actually know where their food comes from. You know, we've had that disconnect over the last few decades. And, and I think that's starting to, to come to light again. And you're seeing uh, incredible initiatives of cities that are um, actually having uh, environmental or agricultural directors within mm -hmm. cities. They're pushing some of these policy changes and programs. And I think the truly innovative cities are going to be doing more of that. And that's going to attract growth of their cities um, and add to the overall quality of life in them as well. Well, they've proven that being part of nature and gardening actually adds to your life. So I think for people to be interested in this and fascinated, this has all sorts of benefits. And Michael, I love, love, as you, as you know, watching all the developments that you're working on and things that you're designing and just how, again, they're so forward thinking and, and so fascinating. And, and I, so I thank you for that and everything that your team is doing and um, look forward to so much more. And I want to thank everybody for watching today. And uh, yeah, and I'm sure that I'm going to say, can you come back on and tell us the latest <laughs> happening? Because it sounds like, you know, there's going to be a, a lot more. Maybe, you know, instead of you saying to people, we should be doing this, maybe more cities are going to say, we've got to be doing this, right? Yeah, that's what I'm excited to see is, is kind of what's what's next and who's actually implementing it. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. And for everybody who has liked watching this today, make sure that you like the show because that'll keep it coming up. And so when people are searching on YouTube for urban agriculture, farming, vegetables, anything else they might be looking for that we talked about on this show, if you've liked this, it'll help more people find it. We also encourage you to share it. And if you have ideas or other questions, you can put those in the comments below and Michael and I will be certain to get back to you. Do you have ideas for other guests we should have? Again, put them in the comments below subscribe and like and put them in the comments. Lastly, lastly, I always want to remind people that we have choices in how we spend our money. So as I was saying today, we have choices in how we spend our money on our food. We can focus on local farming and local production. And that again, helps drive that economic driver, that economic machine of having more local food. The same goes for when we buy our clothes. And so this is a separate 
campaign that we have at my office called Put Your Money Where Your Mouth Is. But I do my best to buy clothes and jewelry and accessories that are from women-owned businesses. And I know that those dollars will help them continue to thrive and their companies thrive. So I just want to mention that my jacket is from Peach and my rep is Marie Lescalite. But I also, this is Stranded by Lex. And she was a college student who started a, a jewelry company out of her out of her dorm room. And she's since graduated. And if you look up Stranded by Lex on Instagram, you'll find a lot more of her jewelry. It's so cute. I just got a box this week. Whoops, this way, this way. This is this is the, uh, oh my gosh, the um, wishbone, the wishbone. And why was this one important to me to buy? Because my grandmother always took the wishbone and she'd let them dry. My brother and I would get to pull it and uh, we'd each get to make a wish. So I was really excited when I saw on Stranded by Lex that they had a wishbone and that I could order that and wear that something special for me. So anyway, continue to watch our stories. We'll put up more pictures of the different projects that Michael's worked on. We'll put up more about the women-owned businesses that we support just in general. If you know people who would like to be featured on the show with their, you know, whether it's their designer, they've got jewelry and they can just let us know about it. Uh, it might be something that I can wear. I can promote in our stories or on social media. And again, we thank everybody for being fans of Live with Lisa and we'll see you again.